our show, which is opening tonight. Uh, I'm in fifth grade, you are in, you are in kindergarten. Two one-act plays in tribute to Maria Irene Fornes, written by some of the illustrious people I'm standing in front of right now. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, get out of the way and just say thanks to the Lewis Center, thanks to uh, you can look on the website at arts.princeton.edu slash Fornes and get a full list of this weekend's activities as well as our full list of funders. And, uh, and so thanks to all of those folks and thanks for being here. Uh, but I would like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, um, Anne Garcia Romero. Anne Garcia Romero is a uh, playwright, a scholar, and an educator. Uh, who has been uh, working as a playwright for decades and is also in a, in a very distinctive cate category of scholars. She is a professional playwright who is also a PhD holder and a, an assiduous scholar and critic of contemporary Latinx and other playwright, other modes of traditions of playwriting. And so she's an incredible uh, presence in the field uh, and, it's, and, and it's an incredible honor to introduce her today to guide us in this conversation of the playwright's pedagogic legacy. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Anne Garcia Romero. Thank you so much, Brian, and thanks for all of you for being here this afternoon. Um, I'll give some brief introductions to my two illustrious guests on my right and my left, then we'll talk a bit about their plays, a bit about their teaching, and then open it up to all of you for some question and answer toward the end. Um, to my left, Migdalia Cruz is a playwright, lyricist, translator, and librettist, a new dramatist alumna. She was a New York Foundation of the Arts Fellow and the Helen Merrill Distinguished Playwright. She's been nurtured by Sundance, The Lark, and by her mentor, Maria Irene Fornes at INTAR. To my right, Matt Wellman is a playwright and novelist, a new dramatist alumnus. He received his third Obie Award in 2003 for Lifetime Achievement. He received an award from the Foundation for Contemporary Performance Arts. He is the Donald A. Fine Distinguished Professor of Playwriting at Brooklyn College, where he's the coordinator of the playwriting program. Please help me welcome Adelia Cruz and Mac Wellman. So I want to begin today talking about uh, both of your plays that are in this evening this, uh, of plays uh, that Brian mentioned, I'm in fifth grade, your kindergarten, two short plays to honor Maria Irene Fortness, and your play, The New Lunu, Mac, and your play, Medallia, The Book of Meow. Um, can you talk about how your plays were influenced and inspired by the work of Irene Fortness? <laughs> <laughs> well, this this particular play because I knew I had it was a new it's a new play and it was a commission play for Princeton, so I knew what my task was but I didn't know how to go about it, so I started I decided I wanted to take a play of Irene's, and uh, work on a script that I worked on when I first met her in 1984, when she accepted me into her workshop even though she thought it was a really bad play, <laughs> she told me so. <laughs> But she said, thought I had potential, so I thought, well, I'm going to rewrite that play, which was based on a short story by Colette called Grabiche. I'm going to take that play, and I'm going to take Irene's play, Promenade, and I'm going to write a Fantasia Cabaret about uh, memory loss and, uh, and constellations. So I did it. So what I did, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, the way I used Irene's work, um, I had read about how she had written Promenade on from index cards, so she like take, took all. So I took all the characters from both sources, from the Colette and from Fornes. I put all the characters on index cards, and I put all the all the scenes on index cards, and I put lines from each of the original sources on index cards. And I'm just going to mix it all up and see what scenes I write, and uh, and from the random find the specific, which is what Irene was all about. So that's, I mean. It's, Pretty direct influence, but I uh, I never took a class with her, but I, I knew her on and off as a, a colleague in the theater. Actually, uh, I saw uh, Beth and her friends in the original production, it's Broadway on 8th Street. And as I was going up to see the show, the elevator stopped in between two floors. <clears throat> and I had to climb through the top of the elevator and drag three people out of the elevator <laughs> to the, the floor where 
the show was going on, I got a standing ovation. <laughs> and I also enjoyed the play a lot. <laughs> uh, I admire her work a lot. Uh, I, 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 what I particularly admire about her is she's not a pretentious, she was not a pretentious uh, playwright as a lot of people are. And she, she was very collegial. And I, every time I ran into her teaching, we would have very good discussions about the people who we were mentoring. Um, I ran into her, I think the last time was at the <coughs> book party of, for a book of hers. <coughs> And I happened to have a play called Fadoo Lanu being done at Soho Rep. And I said, I really want to come see my play. And then nobody would ever come see. I mean, no one does that, but she did. <laughs> so she came to see my play and said nice things about it. I, I think I remember. <laughs> but uh, I remember most what a, a wonderful presence she was. And also one of the few directors who's real, or, uh, Writers, who's really a great director as well. Um, so I, 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 I think the world of her. Um. Great, thank you, Zach. And you know, Zach, I mean, really, in both of your works, um, I'm really struck how you're exploring intersections of both um, culture and history, and you kind of riff on both of those. I know, Magdalena, you were saying how you use index cards for the various aspects. Um, and in, in your piece, you mentioned it's a Fantasia cabaret, and there's influences of, of French cabaret, Cuban cabaret, and then Mac, in your piece, said in Ybor City, Florida, you have influences of um, sort of Cuban culture, Florida culture. <coughs> what are the ways that those cultural and historical aspects influence the writing of the play, the inspirations for the plays? <coughs> My play was commissioned by a, a theater company in Tampa, Florida. So I went down there and snooped around <laughs> and uh, did a lot of research and, and uh, found out there are a lot of connections in Ybor to Cuba, but also to the anarchist communities of Spain and Italy. And that interested me a lot. Uh, che Guevara and Castro both came to uh, Tampa. Uh, the anarchists were very powerful there. And in the 20s, uh, it was one of the first cities in the South uh, to drive out the KKK. Because the KKK came to town, I think 21, 22, and all the anarchists were up on roofs with rifles and told them to get out of town. And they did. And they never came back. So all of these weird connections made a huge impact on me. Uh, and I, I, I just studied a lot of the local history. It was, uh, it was first done as, as a play called Why the Why, and then I worked on the script a lot more, and it was done at Soho Rep a few years later. But uh, she, I, I never studied with her, but I certainly was influenced by her work. And I think uh, at that point in New York, she was certainly one of the most influential playwrights. I wish she still were, um, but she's a remarkable presence in the American theater. Great, thank you, Mac. So the question is, what were the cultural influences? Well, how did the cultural and historical influences um, that you explore and you riff on in your play, how did that inspire the writing or inspire the creation of the world? Well, you know, I feel like it all came out of my head, so I would say this is the influence. <laughs> but, um, but it's more like what I know of Irene, especially in her, in her, uh, as she got ill with Alzheimer's. What I, what I, what I saw that she still reacted to, and her sense of music and fun, and uh, you know, listening to Edith Piaf and Compay Segundo, and um, you know, Astor Piazzolla. Those are the things that excited her. Uh, when she could still, she, when she was still talking, she would be singing, you know, Guantanamera alongside East Side West Side all around the town. It was just like, it's like, where are we? <laughs> where is Irene's head? And I just, and so I sort of focused on where, what is her head, like what is going on, and what does it mean when you lose your memory? And what is it, mean, and what are the memories you do remember, and what, do you remember them completely? And how do you, as a as a writer, 
how do you hold on to your story? So that was really my influence. I was thinking about um, disease and, um, and intellect and how, um, how, they, how they moved in this weird plane once you, once you feel like sort of get removed from the world and, and into, your, into your body, into your head. Yeah, because I'm, I'm struck by how memory works in both of your plays. Uh, memory, you said of sort of, um, in your case, thinking about like what is an Irene's memory. Um, but it, how, how does that kind of collage of memory also impact form? So both of your plays have songs. They both um, have a variety of locations. Um, structurally, they, they kind of are very expansive. So how, it, does memory in some way influence form of the actual play? <clears throat> I think so, but uh, I, don't, I mean, you have to write using memory. Well, how you use it is up to you. Um, I, I admire the way she used memory because it was, it was not, uh, I don't know, It was not simple-minded, it was not uh, what gets taught in most schools. It was more interesting and it, it was more surprising. Uh, I, I think the most interesting way of approaching playwriting now is to use epiphany rather than narrative. Epiphany is like a slap in the face that wakes you up. And her plays often do that slap in the face and wake you up. <laughs> and uh, that to me is interesting. Um, predictable uh, theater narratives don't do very much for me, and I don't think they did very much for her. Uh, I, I remember talking with her, and she said she got into playwriting because at the time she was living with uh, Susan Sontag, who took a creative writing course, <clears throat> and was baffled by this course and gave an assignment to. Uh, Irene to look at and was about writing a play. So she wrote a play. And then she turned into a playwright. God help her. <coughs> but, uh, I, don't th I think it's always things happen to you and it's how you respond to them that's interesting. Um, that's, that, that is something that interests me a lot. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and I think for me, I think memory is like full of lies. Like things you think you remember, you don't remember them correctly, and then you go back to think about them again, and you remember another detail that maybe is false, but it seems so vivid. So it's like for me, memory and dream world are uh, live, live side by side. So I think as a writer, you're constantly looking for those. For me, anyway, me as a writer, I'm always looking for those places where they uh, where they live in a parallel space, and um, and and not so much remember things, but re-remember to dream things. Yeah, and the whole notion of sort of um, epiphany and truth telling, um, I guess I want to circle back again to kind of issues around like aesthetics and the form, because with Fornessa's plays, um, every play was formally very different. Um, and she never ascribed to a particular narrative model. It was really, what does this play have to be? Um, and I'm kind of curious, just maybe as, as playwrights in general, like how, how does the form of the play reveal itself, and how perhaps in these two plays, how did the form reveal itself in the writing? Hmm. Well, for me, it was, it, was, it was, I sort of, I followed Irene's, like, a guidebook to Promenade, mm -hmm. so I followed that form, but it could have, I mean, it could have taken any direction, because I, because that's the whole, that's the, the beauty of Irene, is that it can go in any direction. It could have been a musical, it could have been a monologue. <laughs> uh, I didn't know, but as I started to write it, I realized that for me the most important part of, the char of Irene's character now is this idea of music and what her music is and what her, what her music used to be and how, and the musicality of her characters. It was less about um, what shape it was gonna take, it was more like how it's gonna sound. What are the, you know, what's, what's the soundscape inside her head? That's what I was sort of focused on. So that, that's what informed the form, I guess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I wrote Fanu a long time ago, and um, 
I remember what I was thinking about at the time formally was a, a Greek play called The Amenities, which is about the creation of a political state. Uh, and the, the fact that you had uh, Castro, Che Guevara, and all these anarchists in Tampa, Florida, that interested me a lot. And I, I'm very interested in political theater, but not in the kind of lectures, because I think that's a waste of time. <clears throat> I'd rather uh, create plays that, again, slap you in the face, make you doubt what you think you believe in. Uh, but I just let it go where it wanted to go. And a lot of it had to do with places in Tampa. Basically, it was set in the Italian blood, but there were all these incredible places there that are still there. And it's, uh, you go almost to any place, and there are wonderful stories in every nook and cranny. Um, so, kind of moving towards now, you're both teachers of playwriting, um, and for Nessa's playwriting method, she taught in theaters, universities, arts organizations, and she used very unconventional means, a unique combination of visual art techniques, acting techniques such as visualization, drawing, yoga, uh, sense memory, to help her students generate new play material. I'm kind of curious, as both, both of you as longtime playwriting teachers, um, what are ways that you help your students access that unique voice that they have as writers? Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I first started teaching, I thought I had to teach them what I knew. And since I didn't know anything, it made me feel very embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have them write a monologue with the same number of words as to be or not to be monologue. <clears throat> and, but as things progressed, I began to get dubious about that. Um, at one point, uh, I had an experience. I was offered a commission to write a play, um, and I knew the play would get some attention because of who was doing it. So I was sitting down in the New York Public Library <coughs> trying to figure out what the hell I would do. And I basically didn't know what the hell I was doing. And it occurred to me, what would I do if I did know? What would, if I were Shakespeare or, or Aeschylus or somebody like that? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I felt more confident. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a play, and it actually did get some attention. Uh, and then I, ch so that made me change my notion of what creative writing was all about. I don't think uh, it's about teaching people rules for how to do things. The thing that it's about is uh, getting you to create the ego that can create. Uh, the other thing that's happened more recently, uh, I began to notice all of these people were coming to these writing programs. I was trying to figure out what the hell is this all about? <coughs> I mean, it's it's. It's all over the country, too. And then, finally, I, it occurred to me, uh, when I came to New York, you could rent an apartment for $200 a month on 14th Street. You could get a job at a coffee shop. You didn't have to have a job. That world is long gone. <clears throat> the only way you can uh, meet your own generation is go to one of these programs. And that's why people go to them. Mm -hmm. It's not to have me tell them how to write a play. It's to meet other people of their generation. Because the theater changes every 10 or 15 years. <clears throat> so the thing that I focus on now is introducing people to each other. And I'm very good at that. <laughs> but it's, it's important because uh, what my generation wanted to do is we sort of did it. But there's a two or three newer generations come along since then. And that, to me, is very interesting. I think when I teach, I um, I teach the only way I know that I actually learned from, because I had two degrees in playwriting and I still didn't know how to write a play until I met Irene, <laughs> is I learned how to, um, I don't know, lead, lead people to find their own voices. And I don't know how, I don't know exactly how I do that, but I think I do a lot of like, like a, um, I don't know if it's like, a, 
conjuring a visualization of Irene. Like I always think about her voice when I teach. And her, she had a tiny little Cuban accented voice that was just, with that, as small as it was, it was fierce. So I think about all that energy that she brought with her into the teaching, into the teaching, into the classroom. And I think about the things that she valued. And I also, the one thing I do that she doesn't do is I also bring in poetry, because I feel it's important to start with words you know are good before you start to try to find your own voice, like listen to how someone, a poet, picks precise words in a precise order, at a precise order on a page. So when you see, uh, when you read a good poem, you kind of begin to understand the value, I think, of, uh, of imagery and, um, and starkness that, and you know, it's like how, how many words does it take to really uh, write a good image? Not that many. People like Irene did it beautifully with, you know, two words. There are other people who take, you know, 25 pages to write the same thing. To me, that's not good writing. <laughs> then it's sort of like, it's like expansive and it's like, that's a novel, that's something else. But in a play, you want it to be alive and you want to, tell it, to create its breathing art. So for me, it's like allowing people to have, find their own voice and dissuading them from thinking that it has anything to do with plot mm -hmm. and taking them out of the academy <laughs> in their heads. Because um, I feel like it, uh, what is taught now is how to critique each other in most uh, play. In most uh, play. In most uh, play.